Okay, I started already my lecture without you. <laughs> I mean, I left on the blackboard some comments that I wanted to do. Today is the last session of this mini course. And so I'd, I'd like you to, I don't know if you can see, this is too low. Okay, so first comments about the discussion we, we, got, we had yesterday about the Poisson cohomology of, of the dual of a Lie algebra. I like to, some people asked me at the very end because it was a bit confusing the discussion. Uh, Giovanni wanted to know, uh, I also wanted to know. So I went and double check uh, in, by the book in, the, in this, this is a very commendable book. Uh, it's not my book, so I can make propaganda. Uh, this is a book by Di Fruan Sung, which is Poisson Structures and the Normal Forms. And it's, it's a good book. There are several very good books in the literature. There is this book, the book by Paul Vanak, uh, Anne Picheron, Camille Laurent Gengou, uh, which I have in, in my room. It's, it's a bit heavy. It's also a good book. This is maybe better to start. And it contains a good description of several aspects of Poisson geometry. And one is Poisson cohomology. So if you go to page, I think it's page 53, then you find a little bit a summary of the discussion of the Poisson cohomology of the dual of a Lie algebra. Okay, so yesterday uh, the problem I had was about notation. Okay, so if I have a Lie algebra, I have several uh, Lie algebra cohomologies associated to it. And one of them, and is the one that it's relevant, is the Cheval-Elemer cohomology, which is associated to the representation okay, of the Lie algebra on the space of C infinity functions, which is given by the, by the bracket, by the Poisson bracket. Okay? How do I do this, this representation? I take an infinitesimal generator of the Lie algebra, okay? and as Pavel explained, I have a representation on the space of C infinity functions as the Hamiltonian vector field via this bracket. Okay, and then I have, uh, since the set of C infinity functions is a module, is a G module, then I have a, a, a recipe to compute this cohomology, okay? In this case, the differential, uh, the differential is given by a Cartan type formula, okay, where the representation shows up. Okay, so in general, we always have this equality where this is a neighborhood of, uh, which has to be invariant by the coadjoint representation. Okay, so uh, there were uh, some discussions yesterday. Can we say more about this? So we have an identification of uh, the Poisson uh, cohomology with uh, Cheval-Ellenberg cohomology. Indeed, we can always uh, look at Poisson cohomology as a Cheval-Ellenberg type complex, but not time to discuss this today. But in the case G semi-simple of compact type, as it was said yesterday by by Pavel and the discussion we had with Rui. In this case, we have an identification, okay, of this, uh, we can really uh, make this thing more explicit and we have an identification as, as, this, uh, as this product, where this is the, the Lie algebra cohomology and then we have the terms of G invariant functions, okay? And this is because there is a generalized version of the Whitehead lemma for which we really need uh, G to be semi-simple of compact type, okay? You can find these discussions, well, this, these are, this is contained, and this is valid also for poisson Lie groups. And this was done by Lu, so references here. This was done by Lu. It was done by Victor Gin's work, the one in Santa Cruz, and it was done by Weinstein himself. In the, in the case of poisson Lie groups, in which the action to consider is the dressing the dressing action, and then we need to consider the, the dual Poisson Lie group, which was discussed in the lectures by Pablo. Okay, but I didn't really want to get to that, just to let you know that in that case, uh, we, have, we have this identification, and in the case uh, G semi simple, we, we can really compute this Poisson cohomology. This is the message. So we have, we have a hands on uh, way to compute. Okay? So, what about, let me do a little bit, today is the last lecture, so I really want to get somewhere. Uh, this is a little bit the scheme of what I've been doing during this, these lectures. Well, we, uh, I've been doing more things, but uh, if I want to look at the, if, if the 
pipeline of these lectures is to discuss a little bit integrability, then the, the objects which were important in the first lecture, I introduced Poisson manifolds, and uh, just by looking at this paper of the very Poisson, which by the way, Yvette told me that you can really find in the exhibition is number 15, so then go and check. Then in that very paper, we saw that constants of motion were, were important, okay? So today I want, I want to understand these constants of motion in a geometrical way. In the second lecture, we described very quickly the singular foliations implied in Poisson cohomology, which, uh, which were the, fo the, the symplectic foliation, in which we, we discussed integrability thanks to Stefan Sussman theorem for singular foliations. And today we're going to see a new important singular foliation uh, can be singular, which, are, which is uh, invariance of manifolds of a dynamical system, okay? We also discussed what was a Poisson map, and today as a, our, this object in, in, the, in the context of integrable systems, it's going to, to be, uh, the examples that are going to be the important are the moment maps, which were also described in the talk by, by David, and uh, Tim's method, which is a very nice way to construct uh, integrable system, systems on the dual of Lie algebras. Yesterday, we spent a long while discussing Poisson cohomology. There's something else we discussed, which is also important, which was uh, uh, splitting theorem, right? So local normal forms plus normal forms. Okay, and very quickly at the very end, because time was over, I said that this, uh, that uh, the second cohomology group provided a way to generate examples of commuting functions, okay? So the role of compatible Poisson structures and B Hamiltonian systems would be the, the dynamics of this. And today is the fourth lecture, so today I really want to discuss in this, uh, in the same line, my geometrical objects will be to discuss local normal forms. In the presence of symmetries. And, and, and the big object today here is going to be integrable systems. So what I want to do with these integrable systems, first describe some ways to construct them. And I want to give a kind of local normal form, indeed semi-local normal form, which is action angle coordinates. Uh, there are many, many uh, theorems of action angle coordinates. The one that you are familiar with probably is the one of symplectic geometry, okay? Uh, I'm going to give a version for regular Poisson manifolds, and there are some versions for singular Poisson manifolds, which are the difficult ones, uh, but these, these in, the, in the most possible generality are done in the context of non-commutative interval systems. I, I plan to discuss this at the very end, but not, not, no, I, I won't be able to give a proof. Uh, but this is, this is done in paper, so I can give references. Okay, and then in some particular cases, uh, during these lectures, I've been showing an example, which is an example I'm, I'm, I'm enjoying a lot lately, which is the, the case of B-symplectic manifolds, also called log-symplectic manifolds. At the very end of my talk, I plan just to say that we can improve a little bit the results we have in the general context for those. And the role of uh, Hamiltonian actions and toric actions is going to be a key one. Okay, so let me start the lecture recalling what I said at the very end very quickly, or maybe I didn't say, I'm going to do the same I do with my students, let me recall and then I start doing new things. So uh, let's say, let me recall. What, what are, uh, compatible Poisson structures, because this connects the topic of Poisson cohomology with the topic of integrable systems. So the first definition is going to be two Poisson structures of 
are compatible if the Scouton bracket that now we know how to compute equals zero, okay? And uh, in other words, I could, I could say that pi two is a cocycle in pi one plus and cohomology. So remarks, this is the same as saying that pi two is a cycle, is a two cycle in H2 of uh, pi 1 of my manifold. Uh, I have to fix the manifold. Okay. okay, this is the first remark, and the second remark is uh, that the case of compatible Poisson structures is very connected to the, to the path method. Uh, in symplectic geometry, uh, how do you prove Darboux theorem? Well, Darboux himself proved uh, doing explicit changes of coordinates, but uh, there was uh, Mosser, Mosser in 80, I think, I don't remember. It was Mosser's paper, I don't remember. So Mosser invented a very powerful tool to the form uh, geometric structures in the context of symplectic geometry. And I'm going to leave the equation here without going very farther, but uh, Mosser's equation is based on the idea that we can deform uh, symplectic structures, which are a particular case of Poisson structures, uh, that lie in the, same Poisson, in the same cohomology class, which are now, as you know, it's just a RAM cohomology. Okay, and this is thanks, in the case of compact manifolds, and this is thanks to this equation, and omega t is a path of symplectic forms connecting two given symplectic forms. Uh, the condition that given two symplectic structures, a path is symplectic in the global setting is an additional hypothesis in general, not in a two-dimensional case, but uh, locally, uh, if I have two symplectic structures and I take the linear path, the linear path is always locally a path of symplectic structures and this comes from linear algebra. Well, what I've just said in the case of symplectic forms is no longer true in Poisson geometry. Okay, so uh, why is not longer true? Because locally it's not true in general that if I take uh, a given Poisson structure and I do this path, okay, not even locally, this is not necessarily a Poisson structure. And this can be a bit frustrating if we want to copy exactly in the same way the proofs from the symplectic context, okay? But it's also challenging, again, frustration and challenge. So uh, why? Because we need to, to find different ways to handle this thing. One, one would be to go, as you will see today, we start the, the, the next lecture about Lie algebra to go to the symplectic group points and, and play the, the game there, but you have to come back to your Poisson manifold and this is not so easy. But okay, coming back to this, if I have two compatible Poisson structures, then the path locally is going to be a Poisson structure. So this is uh, really interesting. So the, uh, let's say that the, compared to symplectic geometry, there are, additional, there are additional constraints in the Poisson context. And these are, of course, cohomological, okay? So two, the second remark is that if we have two compatible Poisson structures, then any combination of them, let's say alpha plus beta, is, some, is also Poisson. And, well, this is a computation you can do, okay? Because I need to check that the Scouton bracket vanishes, okay? But if I, if I do this computation, I have to develop this. Alpha and beta are constant, of course. I'm going to say the same thing. For me, alpha and beta are always constant. So if I do this computation, okay, then what do I get? I get, uh, I get uh, that this has uh, terms where I have pi pi, okay, pi one pi one, then I know that this vanishes because pi one is itself a Poisson structure, times that it has pi two and pi two, and then it has exactly two times alpha beta 
2 times alpha beta pi 1 pi 2. OK, so this is 0 because I'm assuming th that this is a cross cycle. OK, so what else? Compatible Poisson structures are very peculiar in the following sense. They provide a way to, uh, to construct commuting functions, to, constant, to construct constants of motions. OK, so for this, I need the definition of the Hamiltonian system, OK? which is a vector field is called the Hamiltonian. With respect to two different Poisson structures, if this vector field is at the same time Hamiltonian with respect uh, to pi 1 and Hamiltonian with respect to pi 2. OK, so if this vector field is, I'm going to use the notation. And I'm going to put a, sup a superscript to the node, the Poisson structure I'm referring to. So this is the Hamiltonian vector field with respect to pi 1. And then this is the Hamiltonian vector field of f2 with respect to pi 2. OK? A direct consequence of this formula, which is really nice, is that if I have a B Hamiltonian system, OK, I have a way to produce uh, commuting functions. So the, the proposition is that uh, if a vector field x be Hamiltonian and let f1 and f2 be the Hamiltonian functions, then <coughs> uh, we have the following equalities. f1, f2, with respect, Poisson bracket with respect to the first Poisson structure, this is 0, and f1, f2, with respect to the second Poisson structure is zero, OK? Why, why is this true? Let me do it here. The proof I can do it in this small square. Uh, this is very simple. I know that the bracket of F1 and F1 with respect to pi 1, this is 0. How do I know this? Antisymmetry. OK? Now, I write this, this thing here. This is exactly, by definition, the Hamiltonian vector field of f1 applied to f1. Definition of what is the, the bracket. OK? This is what I want to see. Well, this is true. And now, the Hamiltonian vector field with respect to f1 let me put the sub superscript here, pi 1. Because of this equality, this is exactly the same. Here I use that it's the Hamiltonian. This is the same as xf2 of pi 2 applied to f1. But by definition, this is exactly the bracket f2, f1 with respect to pi 2. So this is 0. So because I developed this equality, I use uh, that it's be Hamiltonian, and obtain that it's commuting with respect to the other Poisson vector field. OK? So the same happens than if I change the role of f1 and f2. So uh, Poisson cohomology, so cycles in Poisson cohomology, are giving me a way, in the case I have this peculiarity of having a vector field, which is B Hamiltonian, are giving me a way to produce commuting functions. And commuting functions are important. Commuting functions is what Poisson was looking for when he wanted to solve uh, 
mechanical problems. He wanted to integrate equations. Now we care about the geometry, but then he wanted to integrate equations. So now uh, I'm going to show I'm going to show <clears throat> I'm going to show uh, a couple of examples. Yeah, yeah, of course. Of course, of course. Be Hamiltonian with respect to pi 1 and pi 2. Here I studied, but it's very, very good. Pi 1 and pi 2 compatible Poisson structures. Otherwise, this is. So we are really going from Poisson cohomology, which is uh, an algebraic object, to commuting functions, which are, is a dynamical system, we could say. OK, so first example, this is uh, what was example five in the first lecture. OK, so I'm going to take as first example two symplectic forms, which is a particular case of uh, Poisson structures. And this comes naturally from Cauchy-Riemann equations. Okay, this, this beautiful example, you can find it, uh, I, I learned this from Paul Vanake and his wonderful group. He has several books and, and one of them is on algebraic integrability and this is in page 54. So I take an holomorphic function from C2 to C and I have a way to produce an integrable system on a four-dimensional manifold. I mean, two commuting functions on a four-dimensional manifold. So uh, if, since f is holomorphic, Co Cauchy-Riemann equations hold, and Cauchy-Riemann equations, and this indeed should be an exercise on the list, because I'm not going to do it now, but one can check that we can reinterpret these equations as uh, the fact of a certain vector field being Hamiltonian, B Hamiltonian, with respect to two Poisson structures, which in this case are two symplectic structures, which are compatible, okay? And the, so we can really write uh, Cauchy-Riemann equations as uh, these equations here, that you have here in terms of the brackets of zero, one, and one. These brackets, so the first bracket, which would be pi zero, corresponds to the real part of the symplectic form, of the complex symplectic form, which uh, we call omega zero, okay? And uh, the second bracket corresponds to the Poisson bracket associated to omega one, the imaginary part of this, of this uh, complex Poisson, uh, symplectic form, okay? Then uh, one can really check that, well, these equations from what I say, you don't need to check, this implies automatically that G that the real and the imaginary part of an holomorphic uh, function provide commuting uh, uh, functions for both Poisson structures, which are symplectic structures indeed, okay? And the nice thing about this example is the dimension of my manifold, of my ambient manifold, if I look at it uh, from the real point of view, is four, okay? And I have two commuting functions. Can I have more? The answer is no. I cannot have, if I have a symplectic form, I cannot have more commuting functions if they are reasonably independent, okay? If they are independent, I cannot have more. And the reason is uh, that if I look at the Hamiltonian vector fields of these two functions, they are going to span a Lagrangian. Uh, the, the, the manifold which is going to integrate them is going to be a Lagrangian submanifold of the symplectic manifold. And we know Lagrangian submanifolds have dimension, half of the dimension of the manifold. Thus, I cannot have more than half of the dimension of the manifold, okay? So this leads me indeed to the definition of integrable system in the symplectic setting, okay, which uh, is, uh, is very well known. Okay. So let me erase this. So first definition, is the one of symplectic geometry. <laughs> Interval system. On symplectic manifolds. 
So this has to even. So it's the following one. An interval system is given by a set by n functions where n is half of the dimension of the manifold, which satisfy such that, first thing, these functions are functionally independent on a dense set. How do I say functionally independent? So I look at the differential of F1, okay? I unimpose that this is indeed, this does not vanish on a dense set. And secondly, very important, okay, uh, that they commute, okay, with respect to the Poisson bracket associated to the symplectic form. So, Remember that the bracket, we have it, if, if we have the particular case of symplectic manifold, the bracket is like that. Okay, this is something you know already. So we have, and we cannot have more commuting functions, that's all we can have, okay? Uh, today I'm going to concentrate on the regular aspects of the objects. There is a whole world behind this. So for instance, even in the symplectic case, if you, you can work in the, in the neighborhood of a regular point and then you get uh, arnold liouville theorem, or you can work, or you can like uh, singularities, okay? Or you can have this, this defect that you like singularities or this verge. If you like singularities, then you are going to try to work out what happens if you are in a singular point here, okay? And then there is a whole world there. There are many people in this audience, uh, Alvaro, Alvaro Pelayo, who has been working hardly the singularities of this system. I also started to do this uh, when I was young, when I was doing my PhD, but I just did uh, semi-local aspects, uh, and there are many beautiful global results in that context. I'm, I'm not going to be able to cite everybody, but at least I can try to cite the people who are in the audience who worked on these aspects. Okay. So this is the symplectic case. And uh, another example, I'm, and now I'm going to go to the Poisson case. And I'm going to start with an exercise of the list, which is exercise 12. This is an exercise that we are going to do this afternoon, okay? So I can just more or less make propaganda why this exercise is interesting. This was example two in my first presentation, which is we look at the dynamical system given by the cross product of the of the gradients of two functions, okay? And this is a B Hamiltonian vector field, indeed. With respect to, uh, indeed, indeed with respect to a family of, uh, of functions. But ta let's take two, we take two functions, the H and K, and we can define these brackets as a determinant, okay? And these are Poisson structures. We are going to check this afternoon that these are Poisson structures. Uh, they satisfy Jacobi. And the flow of the vector field is the solution of equation one, and it's be Hamiltonian with respect to these Poisson structures. So, and now the difference between this exercise and the previous example, this example and the previous example, is that now we are no longer on a symplectic manifold. We are on R3. No way R3 can be symplectic because the dimension is not correct. And Look how many functions we have in involution. We have two functions. Okay, so now we start to think, if I have a Poisson manifold, how many involutive functions can I have? What is the definition of, of, of integrable system in the Poisson context? Okay, I'm going to get to that, but before getting to that, let me revise. Uh, well, this is another example. This is an example, this is the harmonic oscillator. Let me, let me revise what is known in the symplectic context before jumping to the, to the Poisson complex and to the Poisson case. And then what I plan to do is to study the, 
how is the geometry of the of interval systems for Poisson manifolds. Okay? And since time is short, I will restrict myself to regular Poisson manifolds. But there are many people working in the singular aspects. Okay, so this was example four in the first lecture. And uh, this is the coupling of two simple harmonic oscillators. And what I want to stress about this example, this example has two first integrals, blah, blah, don't copy because this is online. Uh, the, the nice thing about this example is that if I look at the, I take these two Hamiltonians, I said this generates a Lagrangian foliation, and if I look how, how is the topology of the, of the, of the Lagrangian two manifolds which integrate this distribution, it's very nice. There are torus, okay? There are torus. There are, I have tori everywhere. Why I have tori everywhere? Is this because of this example? No, uh, if I go to, to the case of a surface, just to convince myself, and I put this nice picture, I want to thank uh, Jeff for, again, for providing me, uh, for helping me all the time, and in particular with these nice pictures. So this is a sphere, and if I have an integrable system, okay, if I have a function, and, uh, well, if I'm assuming that the, that the fibers are compact, they can only be circles, right? Not only they can only be circles, but they, they form a vibration. This would be an example. This is rotations on the sphere, okay? And this, here I consider the sphere with a symplectic form. For once, I'm not considering a Poisson structure. I'm considering omega to be a symplectic form. And I'm considering uh, rotations uh, along the, the axis. And this is Hamiltonian, OK? And indeed, this H is a moment map. And again, there is a whole world uh, behind the study. There is, there is an action by, by circles. And there is a bunch of people here in this audience. I'm not going to be able to pronounce all the names, because the, the class will be over. Uh, who have been working on Hamiltonian actions on torus in the symplectic context, and many beautiful results have been obtained. But I'm going to concentrate on, on, on the interval systems case. This is not a nice picture. This is a picture I did for my thesis defense, and I understand this picture. I think most of the people don't, but I really, I really, I really spent a long time doing this. In not, it's not as nice as the one of Jeff, but okay. So this is a, these are concentric tori. Okay, and this is a picture of, of a theorem, of arnold Liouville theorem, which since I spent three years in France, I learned that there was somebody who called Henry Miner, who was an astronomer, and who was working in really hard for the resistance movement in, in Paris, and he's, if you look at Wikipedia, he's more known for that. But it was the first one who gave a formula for action coordinates. Okay, so since I spent three years in France, and that's it, uh, so far, I'm going to say that this result, I'm going to give some credit to Miner too. I'm going to say that it's Liouville, Miner, Arnold, following a chrono 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 chronographical order here. Okay? So this result tells me the following. It tells me that it's not only because of these examples that I have a vibration by tori. It tells me that if I have a symplectic manifold, okay, and if I have an integrable system, then the, if I assume that the regular fibers are compact, then they are tori. And not only that, all the, the, the fibers in a neighborhood, they are also tori. And the foliation from a foliation, from the, the, the Lagrangian foliation that I get from a foliation point of view, uh, it's very simple. It's just a vibration. It's a vibration by tori. Okay, this uh, result, I'm describing it as a geometer. But if I were a dynamical system, uh, somebody working in a dynamical system, then I would like to, to stress out the, the power of action angle coordinates in the setting of symplectic geometry, which is that, OK, I take Darboux theorem, okay, which tells me that locally I can write my uh, symplectic structure like that. And now I'm going to enhance Darboux, Darboux theorem to make it true in a neighborhood of one of these tori. 
And this is what the action angle coordinates do. They construct some coordinates, p sub pi and theta i, and the, the nice thing is that these are semi-local on the neighborhood of one of these tori, such that the symplectic form is of this type. So indeed, if I want to solve equations here, this is very handy, okay? This is very handy. And this is indeed a normal form result from the point of view I was describing yesterday. This gives me a normal form for the interval system and for the symplectic form at the same time. Okay. A nice consequence also of having action angle coordinates is that one can try to perturb. Okay, and then we have a phenomena of some tori uh, survive, and this is KAM theorem. So one ha once, if we have action angle coordinates, many things can be done. So who are the heroes of the day? These people here. So the first one is Louville, Henri Mineur is the astronomer mathematician who was the first one to give the action, action uh, coordinates. Action coordinates can be described in a very nice way, which is the following. I take this tori, these are Lagrangian uh, submanifolds of my symplectic manifold, and therefore, by a result by Weinstein, they are exact in a neighborhood. So uh, if I have uh, a symplectic structure, then this is the differential of alpha. So I have a kind of uh, exactness, not only in a neighborhood of a point, but in a neighborhood of a Lagrangian fiber, okay? And then I take this alpha, and I can integrate this alpha in one of the cycles of the torus. And this is an action coordinate. And the first time I saw this, this uh, formula, I convinced myself. I really went and looked for the paper, and there is such a formula in a paper by Miner. Uh, which is 1935, I think. Okay, so Liouville, what he did is to observe uh, something which we have seen in the examples, that the fibers are tori. <coughs> and here we have Deuterman and Arnold. Arnold has a proof of, of this uh, theorem in, in his book. And today I, I'm going to, to take the, there is a very nice proof by Hans Deuterman, which is in a paper entitled On Global Action Angle Coordinates, in which he studies the, the problem of existence of action coordinates in a globally, okay? Of course, there are many topological obstructions, and he describes these topological obstructions. But at the very first part of the paper, one thing he does is to give the proof of action angle coordinates, and I really like this proof. So, since I really like this proof, what we did with uh, Paul Van Ake and Camille Laurent Jengu was to copy this proof or to adapt it, if you prefer, to the Poisson context. So today I'm going to explain this proof, which I think is very nice. And uh, still today, many people are using these ideas to prove things. So first thing I'm going to, to say is what is an integrable system on a Poisson manifold? Well, how many first uh, integrals can I have? That's the question. In the symplectic case, I had half of the dimension of the manifold. In the Poisson case, okay, uh, I'm going to say that if my Poisson manifold has maximal rank to R, okay, then how many, how many can I have? At least I can have half of, uh, of 2R. Okay? And then if, the ma if, I, if I'm lucky enough to have Casimir's, which is a coincidence, then I can have as much as the dimension of the manifold, I can add to these ones, these Casimirs, okay? And I can add as much as the dimension of the manifold minus 2R. Therefore, having an interval system, okay, this is assuming that I have Casimirs, which is a restriction from the point of view of topology of the symplectic foliation. Okay, then I have uh, S first integrals, okay? I'm going to assume that they are independent, that they are pairwise in involution, and that I have as much as, so I'm having half of the dimension of the manifold plus uh, exactly n minus half of the dimension of the manifold, which is this s. Okay, so I'm somehow adding the Casimirs to the functions I can have on a regular uh, symplectic leaf of my Poisson foliation, okay? 
So what are the expectations for the study of the geometry of, of this map? This map, I'm going to call it moment map. And the word moment map, as we saw the other ta uh, the, the lectures of David, this is reserved to having a Hamiltonian action. OK? So indeed, uh, it's not an abuse of notation, because the theorem we're going to prove, in particular, is going to tell us that this is a moment map for a Hamiltonian action. OK? So the strategy of the proof we are going to follow is uh, the proof by Deustermatt, which is based on looking for a Hamiltonian action of a torus. So this is what we are going to do today, to look for Hamiltonian actions of torus. And let me say uh, just one thing on the blackboard, which is that in all this business, we have two different, a priori, two different foliations. OK? We have two different foliations a priori. This is like our two foliations, which are foliations in the Sussman case. We have two distributions. The first one is the distribution. So I can consider the Hamiltonian vector fields of the S components I have, OK? I take these Hamiltonian vector fields. Since I have some Casimirs, I know that the rank, maximal rank of this distribution, this rank is always going to be at every point uh, less or equal R. R is the rank of the maximal rank of the, ray of the Poisson structure. So the, the maximal num the rank, because some of them, if I have a Casimir, then it's going to vanish. Okay? But in any case, I can consider this as a distribution. And, well, since we have worked out this formula, we can use it. So this is zero because we are assuming that they are in evolution. So these uh, Hamiltonian vector fields okay, commute. And this is really powerful. They commute, and therefore, the distribution generated by these Hamiltonian vector fields is interable. Interval a priori in the, in the Stefan Sussman sense. So there is a foliation. There is a foliation through each point. I have an, interval, an integral manifold of this distribution. Okay? And this foliation, the lift of this foliation, so uh, there exists F foliation such that at each point, the tangent space to the leaf to the point coincides with the distribution at the point. OK? And uh, this notation, f sub m, this, this is the leaf to the point. And this has a classical name that comes indeed from Liouville. This, this is, these are, we are going to call it invariance of manifolds. So this is the first foliation I have. This is what I'm going to call F1. And then I have another foliation, which is the foliation given by the vibration, given by the moment map. So F2, I'm going to consider uh, F. defines a vibration okay and the, so I have a foliation and this is foliation number two okay these foliations are not too different if I'm in a point which is both regular for this distribution and regular for the Poisson structure, then I'm, I'm, I'm in a regular case and things are very nice and both distributions coincide. Okay? So I'm going to place today myself in this situation, in the regular, regular case. Okay? And 
Well, the first thing, so the idea of the, of the proof is uh, constructing a Hamiltonian action, okay? And so what I'm going to do is to uh, take an improved version of a splitting theorem of Weinstein and use this Hamiltonian action to move it around. So the first thing I, I, I need to do is to uh, work out a little bit more the proof of Weinstein's splitting theorem and say the following. If I have air commuting functions where I need to have these air commuting functions, there is the rank, uh, the maximal rank uh, uh, of the Poisson, two areas, the maximal rank of the Poisson structure, then if I'm in the conditions in which I'm taking a point in which the Hamiltonian vector fields are linearly independent, then this, this result, which is just an adaptation of the proof of Weinstein splitting theorem in our context, tells me that I can keep track in the proof of Weinstein splitting theorem, I can keep track of these functions, P1, Pr. Okay? So then if I keep track of these functions, then my Poisson structure, the result here, is a splitting theorem, okay, where I have commuting functions which are living on the symplectic part of the splitting theorem that we discussed uh, yesterday, and uh, then we have a transverse Poisson structure, okay? This result is telling me that I can keep track of functions as, as long as the Hamiltonian vector fields are independent. This result is not splitting theorem for integrable systems because I don't have uh, here uh, S commuting functions. I only have R commuting functions, which are, well, R indeed can be smaller than half of the rank of the, of the generic rank of my Poisson structure, okay? And the question is, why didn't you do a splitting theorem? Do you think that what is the answer? Because it's not true that we can split integrable systems. So, uh, and we have co a counterexample. Well, we have some counterexamples. You can find counterexamples. And for instance, you can go to our paper with, with Paul Van Ake and Camille Laurent, which is in paper in 2010. Or, and then you can find a counterexample. So important caution here is that uh, integrable systems on Poisson manifolds do not split. So what do I mean by split? I mean, I take splitting theorem which tells me the symplectic foliation is locally the product of symplectic leaf to the point and then a transverse uh, transverse Poisson structure, and the, the transverse Poisson structure has its own symplectic foliation, and the symplectic foliation is the product of the symplectic foliation. And my symplectic leaf, this is Weinstein's splitting theorem. So it's not true that for an integrable system, F is, in general, is not the F sub S comma F sub T. That's not true in general. So we, indeed, if, a, if an integrable system does this, then it splits. It's not, in general, it's not true for any Poisson structures, but there are subfamilies of Poisson structures for which this is true, okay? So if you want to see a, a counterexample, indeed, uh, I've more or less put this counterexample in the list of problems which are, which are without saying it. This is an example, exercise six. Is, uh, provides a counterexample of this. But in exercise six, six, I didn't ask to prove that this was a counterexample. If you want, I mean, the, the proof is just at looking at a very, uh, very fine contradictions which has to do with the singularities, of course. So, uh, so you, you, you should look at the, then at the paper if you are interested. Okay, so we have this local result, and now we want to construct, like it happens in the symplectic case, following Deuterman, we want to construct global uh, coordinates. So uh, we need to put ourselves in the regular, regular case. Regular means regular, regular, regular for the Poisson uh, structure and regular for the, for the rank of, 
uh, of the of the interval system. Then, of course, I could start working out some other cases. And then the result we proved uh, uh, with Camille Laurent and Paul Van Acke, indeed, we proved the result in the non-commutative setting, but now I'm giving you the, the I would say the cheap version, well, the basic version of the of action angle coordinates on regular Poisson manifolds. Uh, it tells us that we can find a set of coordinates if we compare it to the classical arnold liouville theorem in which ha we have some actions, some coordinates, and some additional coordinates, which we call transverse, which played, of course, the role of Casimir's in such a way that uh, these functions define a diffeomorphism in a neighborhood of the, so this is a semi-local result. This is not a, a local, a, a, in a neighborhood of a point, but it's in a neighborhood of one of these tori, okay? And in a neighborhood I have uh, that uh, the manifold is a product of the tori times uh, BS, okay? The Poisson structure looks like a regular Poisson structure, okay, of constant uh, rank, and it looks like the dual of a symplectic form. And uh, the vibration is just a vibration by tori. This would be the, the, the simplest context. So uh, how do we prove this? The, the proof follows the proof of Deustermatt and has different steps. The first one is to look at the topology of the vibration. So first thing to do is to, to check that the vibration is really a trivial vibration. Well, this is true because I have a submersion and I'm taking a compact, I need to, I'm assuming, that I'm taking a compact leaf of this invariant, uh, I, I'm taking a compact invariant to manifold, so of, this, of distribution F1, okay? And then what I need to do is, is a way to do it would be to take an Erisman connection and I, I redress it. I mean, since it's a submersion, this is true, locally it's going to be a trivial vibration. Okay, then step two, uh, I check that these fibers are tori, and indeed I want to check that there is an action by, by Torai. Uh, I'm seven minutes before the end of my talk, so let me just write something on the blackboard. How do I, this is, this is a key point. How do I define this action? I'm going to do the following. I'm going to define an action uh, First, an action by, by R. I'm going to take this distribution here. The distribution of foliation one is an involutive distribution, and I know that the maximal rank is R, okay? So I'm going to consider, uh, first I'm going to consider an action in a neighborhood, my neighborhood. Well, first I should prove that one of the, uh, of the leaves is a uh, tori, but this is simple. This is very simple. I'm going to assume that I have already done this. So I'm using the same notation. This is time BS, okay? And this is an error. So first, I define an action for which, okay, I'm working in a neighborhood of a compact invariance of manifold, and then from differential equations, I know that if I take the flow, the flow of these vector fields, this flow is going to be complete, not only at the torus I'm taking, but also in a small neighborhood. I'm assuming I'm shrinking this neighborhood already. Okay, so here I'm taking uh, T1, Tr, okay? And here I'm applying this. Now what I'm going to do is to apply the flow, what is called the joint flow of this distribution, which is I take uh, the Hamiltonian vector field of F1 time uh, T1, I compose with the T2 time T2, XF2, and until I'm FR, TR. Okay, here I'm assuming that I'm already ordering these Hamiltonian vector fields in such a way that the R first do not vanish, okay? Then the nice thing is that we, can, we could leave this as an exercise to the students that this defines an action, a Lie group action of uh, R2, uh, of RR, okay? This is a, a group action. Why? Because uh, 
these Hamiltonian flows commute. Since, since the Hamiltonian vector fields commute, their flows commute, okay? And therefore, this is really an action of an, uh, of an abelian group, okay? That's the first thing. Now, the, the, the second thing is to see that this action descends to an action, indeed, of a torus of dimension r. And this is the tricky point, okay? This is the tricky point. Why? Because if I, if I take one of the Liouville tori, okay, and I look at this action here, let me call it alpha. Well, alpha, I said it was a constant, so let me call it phi. Uh, if, I take, if I take this action here, okay, the orbits, uh, this action is transitive, okay? So the orbits are homogeneous spaces, okay? And then, since I'm assuming that the orbits are compact, then the isotropy group of this action can only be at a certain point of this vibration. I'm taking this picture of the vibration here, a nice picture of Jeff. And I'm taking a point here, which I call C, on the basis, okay? And I take a fiber here. So I'm going to control the isotropy. There is an isotropy, and I, the isotropy group has to be a lattice because the quotient has to be a tori, okay? Then this has to be a, a lattice, and this the, depends on the point. A priori, this depends on the point on the base. So if I want to define the action of a, tor of a torus, what I need to do is to check that this doesn't depend, depend on the point on the base that this a priori depends on the point of the base. So what, do, what can I do? I can, so I have some, these are periodic vector fields. So what I need to do is to uni uniformize the periods. And how do I do it? Well, how did Do Hans Deusterman do it? He did it just applying the implicit function uh, theorem to the, to the equation phi of t of m equal t. And you can apply the implicit function theorem just on the base, okay? Because the, the lattice is, the, is not going to depend, depend on the point I'm taking the fiber. And this was the key point in the proof of, of Deusterman. So there is a way to uniformize these periods in such a way that this action, the, the action given by the joint flow, descends to an action by tori. And, and this is really a crucial step in the proof uh, by R. So what is left is to check, once we have this action by tori, we need to check that this action indeed is a, is a Hamiltonian action, okay? Because what are we going to do? If we have a Hamiltonian action by tori, we take a point in one of the tori. In this point, we apply this, uh, this result that I call Darvu Kara Theodori Lee here, okay? If I'm in the, in the regular, regular case, then the gij's are exactly zero. And the only thing I need to do is to drag this normal form using this Hamiltonian action. And that's, that's the proof. So the, the things that remain to be done is to check that this action indeed is Hamiltonian. So then I'm going to use the tools that I introduced yesterday, Poisson cohomology. First, we check that this action is Poisson. Uh, and it's an exercise to see that indeed uh, one, can, uh, one can check that the vector fields, the fundamental vector fields of the action, preserve the Poisson structure but in, a, in, a, in a kind of tricky way. First, we preserve that L2 of P, so the bracket of the bracket of P is zero, and then we use that uh, this is a periodic vector field. That's, uh, its integration is very peculiar, so we get it's a Poisson vector field. Once we have that it's a Poisson vector field, to check that this Hamiltonian vector field is using Poisson cohomology. Poisson cohomology here is quite simple because this is, uh, it's going to be, we have a, a vector field which is tangent to the symplectic foliation for all the symplectic leaves, and this is regular. So indeed it's Hamiltonian. And, and the last step, as I said, is to drag uh, this action of the torus. And that's the proof, and that's the proof. And then there is, there is a, a more general statement for non-commutative interval systems, but I don't want to, it's too late, it's time, okay? And what I wanted to say, just to finish, is that in some particular cases, one can do better uh, if one has singular, uh, not necessarily regular Poisson structures. For instance, for B interval systems, 
And this is something that, uh, so we can prove a more general action angle coordinate, where one of the coordinates is a log function. And this is something that uh, we have done with uh, Jeff Scott and my student Anna Kisenhofer, okay? And we hope to finish soon. And okay, that's all. Thank you very much for your patience. <laughs>